You're listening to the Voices Behind Women's Cricket Chat. That's Hannah, Georgie, Cassie, Mahika and Alex. Coming up on today's podcast... Hi everyone, today we are welcoming to Women's Cricket Chat, Mariko Hill. Plays for Hong Kong Women's Cricket Team. Has captained them, has played for them for a very long time. Been over in Australia playing, part of Fair Break and actually just groundbreaking... You don't necessarily hear cricket in Hong Kong that much, but this girl is at the forefront of it all, and we're so lucky to have her join us today. So welcome to the pod, Mariko. Mariko. Yeah, thank you. You got my name right, at least. Um, but yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, so thank you for inviting me. So obviously yours has been, you know, it's actually quite a long journey, really, your cricket's career at the moment, and you're not even very old, so that's pretty cool. So just to start us off, what got you involved in cricket in the first place? Because it's not necessarily you think, oh, I'm going to go to Hong Kong. I'm going to start playing cricket. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I'm not going to lie. It's quite daunting to think that I'm 27 and I've been playing for 14 years or so. So labelling that makes it a bit scary, but um, it all started when I was 11 years old. And in Hong Kong, you get a bunch of these uh, clubs, sometimes they're quite prestigious. Um, Hannah, I'm sure you you know because you play for MCC and MCC has visited the cricket club before. And basically it's this club that has multiple sports involved. And I basically was part of it as a family member. So we just wanted to go there for dinner, for coffees, etc. And my brother joined um, a grassroots program called Gappers. And essentially, it's basically where a bunch of kids play cricket, 99.5% being boys. I was the only girl at that time. And when I joined, it was just essentially to play with my brother. And from there, um, it really is history. Um, Got scouted after a year in for the Hong Kong National Women's Setup. And of course, when you go on tour overseas, you really don't look back because you're with your best mates, away from your parents, playing the sport that you love. So right off the get-go, I got to really experience that and what an opportunity it was. And you mentioned as well, I did get to venture across to Hong Kong and we did a Hong Kong and China tour as part of the MCC. And I've said it many times that MCC changed my life because before then, I'd never actually gone abroad. So my first tour was to Holland and then the second time was 2014. After my freshers week, which I was very ill, unfortunately, with freshers flu and everything. Maybe the fitness wasn't there. <laughs> and, yeah. and then I, I came to you guys and I broke my finger. So it was it was dreadful for me. It was an amazing experience for me, but it was just dreadful. But I did get to play against you and it was one of the highlights of my life. And it was a very different time back then. It was eight years ago. So can you remember much about that visit from the MTC and what it kind of meant to yourselves as a club and also as a country as well? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, it's a very prestigious thing. Both MCC and the Hong Kong Cricket Club are sort of the two premium clubs in the world, I'd say. And being our young selves, I suppose we were, you know, under the the likes of Sarah and everyone else who really were the pioneers of women's cricket at the time. So here we are as children sort of having fun. And of course, tours, there's an element of seriousness. But when it comes to club tours, it's a lot more laid back and you can really just enjoy it. So actually, I remember a lot of the, the funny stories that came about in the background and what's happened in certain events post-match I'd say let's keep it to that um, but there's a lot Can of stories you, that, that happen. you know there, there are nights out that happens and um, certain people get disappear one of them being Sarah Taylor I believe oh, not Sarah Taylor <laughs> who was it sorry someone really really famous I'm not going to disclose her name disappeared in the middle of the night and from that night we we're like god we were playing tomorrow and of course that was so important to get this player on but yeah it was all just jokes in the end And so obviously that, like Hannah said, that was eight years ago. And you've also been playing in Hong Kong for 11 years now, which is quite a long time. But, you know, Mm. 27, we're not that old. We're not that old. We're not that old. I've been saying it for a while. But what have you seen change in women's cricket in Hong Kong in that time? And what's it gone from when you started to what it's like now? And how is it going to keep growing from there? Yeah, so there's definitely more, um, not only viewership, but attendance through local participation. So when you look at Hong Kong, it's a very international city, influenced by expats to Indian, Pakistani, local Cantonese, or even Mandarin individuals. So, you know, our, our team itself is composed of various different nationalities. And prior to when I first started, I'd say the split was 
80% expats because Hong Kong really was an expat oriented place when it came to cricket. You know, the New Zealanders came in to influence it. But obviously with the Cricket Hong Kong board really pushing and investing into local development, slowly Cantonese people started knowing and understanding the sport through their grassroots program, as well as uh, schools and universities as well. So of course it was a slow start because holding a cricket bat is certainly the most awkward thing to do or teach. And not only that, but teaching bowling is probably the, the most random thing you can teach. So you talk about, you know, bowling like a star and all these analogies. But if you don't watch cricket when you're born, like when you're in India or in England, it's a lot more difficult to teach. So it was definitely a slow, long progress. Um, but slowly we've come to a place where our squad is composed of almost 80 percent locals and everyone's talented in their own individual rights as well. So that's how I'd say it's really progressed. And I, I want to look at the kind of key figures as well within Hong Kong. And I know like Anita Marsh, unfortunately, she's not with us anymore. But have you got a few words about the influence of her? Oh, she has probably the most influence into women's cricket development in Hong Kong, alongside Rodney Miles. Of course, huge advocates of women's cricket. And essentially in Hong Kong, you do need a bit more capital and investment to start because, of course, there are subs involved, kits, etc. And, you know, the wages that women earn in Hong Kong aren't very high. So when there are challenges of that alongside full time work, you really can't suffice for yourself to also play sort of a hobby that you can play on the side and cricket isn't a cheap sport right even a bat costs 300 pounds sometimes so with that not only was there the investment side of things but when it comes to the love and the passion of the game they infused it you know you wanted to turn up because it was just great fun to play alongside all the amazing characters Anita in, in particular there's always fond memories because in cricket one of the perks is that you've got innings breaks and you eat a bunch of in England maybe more teas and sandwiches in Hong Kong however Anita used to bring sort of portable stoves and cook noodles so all the girls would literally just be stuffing themselves midway through the break and being too full but yeah that's definitely some some of the elements that she really carried through and still resonates today and then obviously as well was it last year where Tash Miles rejoined you as well and played for Hong Kong so getting her back over as well how important was that and I guess for her to have that connection back to her mum yeah, absolutely. I mean, Tash is a huge asset to the team. For those who are listening, Tash Miles was born in Hong Kong and went to the UK to play a bit more professional or elite level cricket. And of course, unfortunately, Hong Kong, that was a huge loss for Hong Kong because she's an absolute gun of a batsman as well as a fielder. And of course, when you come from England, you have all this experience and knowledge alongside playing with you know, Sarah Taylor and all that. So she was able to really teach a lot of lessons to the girls and be that senior role I suppose when she came into the squad last year and it just changes the whole demographic right we became a lot more professional just that one percent of being more switched on and thinking about the game um so yeah she's a huge asset and so obviously with Hong Kong you've played in the Asia qualifiers um you've been in how many have you been involved in now so Asia Cup wise there's only one that I've been in um and there's only been one to be honest but there's been other ICC world events so the ICC Asia qualifiers was what was it 2016 was the first one then I capped in two and we just recently played the last one so three qualifiers and you say you captain them what was it like to be a captain so young definitely a challenge the captaincy role came abruptly with a few senior players leaving the team. So at that time, I was, although, what was it, 19 years old, I think, or 20 years old, I was the most experienced because I had gone to Australia, played a, a season abroad. So the knowledge of the game was def definitely there. I've definitely learned huge lessons, even reflecting now. You know, I think age does is very important when captaincy is on the cards because empathy is one element that you need. You need to be selfless. You need to really understand every player. And I think at the time, I really didn't know those elements of personal relationships with teammates, I suppose. Rather, I was like, God, I need to fit into this role as captain and basically try and tactically, you know, improve the team altogether. But then when it sort of sprung up, it was a challenge because my first tournament was the ICC qualifiers. And ICC events, as you know, is, is very professional. It's quite daunting, but I absolutely absorbed the whole experience and it's incredible. And we were so close. In fact, we were really close, but Thailand got the edge of it and managed to go through. 
And what kind of effect do you think that had on your performance? Did you did it make you worry about having to captain, you know, having that extra dynamic, whereas you d- just want to focus on the cricket sometimes? Yeah, a very good question. Um, I think at the time I had no idea that it was influencing my performance. And to this day, I still don't know. It's really hard to pinpoint exactly what. Of course, I performed some games, some, some games I didn't. That's cricket. But when I reflect back now, after I stepped down, I realized that I really had no time to focus on my own game. You know, after a tournament, typically you play back-to-back games in T20. You might get a day off here and there, but after the game, you go back to your room and as a player would think about how you performed, how you improve and how you can carry that on to the next game. Me, on the other hand, maybe I had a five-minute time span to really think about it. But as soon as I arrived back in the hotel, it's obviously recovery, team meetings and personal meetings with the captain. Uh, Sorry, not the captain, but the coaches and the vice captain. And we'd be talking about the team and the game itself. So I really didn't have time to reflect on my game and improve. So I think now that I have stepped down and I've had that time all to myself when I go back to the room as not being captain, I'm like, wow, I can journal. I can really write down what what areas to improve on. And I think it showed through performance in the last tournament that that works. And what was the decision around stepping down as captain? Because you mentioned like you're only about 23 or so when you did just take that step back. And hopefully it has been a positive in the sense that but you can just focus on yourself more. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was multiple reasons. Um, of course, I was already captain for two to three years. Time for always a change. We were a very young team. So it's ultimately about giving others an opportunity. Carrie Chan, who's now the, the captain. I mean, she fits in the ro- role perfectly. And in fact, might be even a better job than me because of how much of a character she is in the team and asset when it comes to understanding every individual and listening as well. So we work hand in hand. And of course, she was vice captain when I was captain. So it was sort of that, that time for her to step up her game and so we can really be on this playing field where everyone starts learning and I'm sure there's going to be more captains to come in the years to come um, and essentially just passing down that knowledge. And how are you passing on your knowledge to any of the youngsters that are coming through? I think he is just setting your own values number one and staying true to it and naturally you will be a role model. It's being respectful to the game along with just really doing the best you can whilst staying humble. I don't want to say that you have to be humble because that's like claiming it, but it's just being stay, staying true to the game and showing key attributes like commitment, right? I'm training 100%, attending every single training and I'm not li- leaving any unsaid or unattended because the more you do that, the more these youngsters think that it's okay to not attend trainings. Then, of course, when it comes to the knowledge of the game, I'd probably be at the top of the run-up, sort of talking to the the bowlers, um, what their plan is, what their attack is, and every individual's had their own game. So it's just really understanding how they want to progress too. And you talk about role models and stuff. How important is it to be that within the local communities and stuff as well? Like, do the local community get to see you guys? Obviously, at the moment, COVID, etc. You're not in Hong Kong at the moment, but do they get to see you in the community? Do you do any school engagements and that kind of stuff boost the profile of cricket? Yeah, so that's definitely a challenge during COVID. Of course, when you're not seen, you're not heard. And I guess with the role model aspect within the Hong Kong squad, it is about turning up to trainings physically. And because myself, Yaz, Ruchi are all overseas, so is Tash, of course, that element is not there. So the best way we can do that is attending Zoom. And we've been doing a lot of fitness at the moment on Zoom and being present and you build that community again. But when it comes to role models of girls outside the squad, yes, media is a huge thing. In fact, I realized, you know, the generation Z and Y and all these other letters come about and social media is a huge aspect. And sometimes I get dms on my instagram from a girl from hong kong being like oh i saw your uh, podcast recently and that's really insightful and might ask me a question and i thought the openness to that was all stemmed from viewership and opportunities that girls get from social media and talking of viewership and opportunities you have been involved in fair break in the past and are going to be involved in the first fair break invitational tournament this summer talk us through all of that because this is a tournament and an organization that has such an amazing opportunity for women in the game from all nations not just the ones at the top that we hear about all the time the associate nations and everyone so what's that been like for you and how much are you looking forward to that yeah I mean first of all awesome way to integrate it absolutely it's all about creating opportunities um but fair break essentially is a platform of creating equal opportunities independent of gender and geographical location 
So as you may know, in cricket or in the cricketing world, you get lots of international countries, test nations like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, New Zealand, England, all the big nations who get plenty of opportunities when it comes to playing at an elite level. But there's a lot of grassroots associate nations like Hong Kong, Singapore, Vanuatu, and the likes of them, who there are a lot of good players within it, but never get the opportunity to be seen because we play, what, one tournament a year or one every two years when it comes to ICC. And whether a girl can play or not is a big question mark too. So the scale or the graph of improving doesn't really correlate to those of the international countries. Um, so Fairbreak essentially is trying to create this platform where it's a tournament involving associate nations along with international nations. So we can really try and reduce that that gap between international and associate nations because there are players like Catherine Bryce, myself, etc., who has been in and out of certain opportunities, like in the Big Bash, there's an associate rookie program that you can be involved in. And that's an amazing opportunity, but that's for two weeks and that's about it. So the growth curve kind of plateaus after that. Fairbreak, on the other hand, is creating this tournament where you get to play six or more games along with the greats and even be in the same team. So it's just learning from the legends of the game and bringing it back to your associate country and funneling funneling it down to the new girls and things who hopefully that that disparity can really reduce and that's what's so good as well i think the integration between people from the top nations who have had this massively established structure for years and years and years like australia and you played over in australia so you've had that as well but then yeah looking to the future that's gonna be something that's so good for developing your game personally is there anyone you've got your eye out for that you're like i'm gonna go and pick her brains while we're there Honestly, everyone, even the associate nations, is really trying to understand how they started cricket, first of all. Everyone's got their own interesting stories. But of course, when it comes to the professional side, you know, learning alongside Susie Bates, Sana Amir, Mignon Dupre, they're all so insightful and legends of the game that they have their own strengths, of whether it's batting, captaincy, bowling, fielding. So yeah, I'll probably be that annoying character that's going to be asking a lot of questions to them. You mentioned some big names there and stuff as well, but like you've mentioned before, you have had experience in the um, WEBL rookie program and stuff. So in that moment as well, what did you take from that experience and what are you going to translate into the fair break experience? Yeah, I think it's more the mental side of the game, to be honest. I remember when I first joined and flew into Australia, it was 2015, so I would have been 21 years old. It was really daunting. You know, you look at social media and Everyone's just humans at the end of the day, but when there's labels to, you know, captain of X and all that, you kind of get scared and you think that they're a lot better than you maturely, physically, mentally, all that kind of stuff. And you think you're not good enough, maybe. That's one of the key aspects that maybe a lot of the associate girls will come into fair break with. But my lesson is everyone's just human and everyone's playing the game that they love, which is cricket. And we're all there to improve. And yeah, it's, it's essentially just learning how they conduct their game, what their habits are, and portraying your skill sets, I suppose. And you've got a few other Hong Kong players out there with you as well. So that would be nice to both be, to all be there and be able to bounce off each other. Which nation have you got your eye on as one that, you know, could be is such an emerging nation in the future as the one we should all keep our eyes out for? Well, obviously, Thailand's said and done before. I think they're already gone past that in fact they've proven their point and in fact they should be in this 50 over world cup no question about it when it comes to emerging teams of course different continents uh, it requires hong kong i'd say of course keep your eye out vanuatu perhaps i'm not too sure actually it's really weird and bizarre because as a associate country within the asia realm we don't really hear much about all the other continents so i genuinely don't know what's going on sometimes america of course is going to be one of the most quickly growing um countries for cricket because of course the amount of investments being put in there so they're definitely one to look out for and uae who of course just recently won the most recent asia qualifiers so i'd say then Hopefully we'll hear more about those individual kind of players from those um, countries because that's what Fair Break's going to do. It's going to give that visibility piece. Yeah. And like you said, you have to be seen to be heard and we'll hear those voices, hopefully. But talk to us a little bit about um, your work with Gencore as well, because they're a big sponsor of the yes. Fair Break, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I always emphasise that, 
you know, Fairbreak and GenCore and my involvement with GenCore is completely separate. There's never any correlation, but I'm just glad that I managed to get that tie because of course, sponsorships are always something. And fortunately I had the power to, you know, speak to it, to my boss. And he's a huge, huge, huge advocate of women's cricket. So um, yeah, he's one of the sponsors, but in terms of my job, um, I'm the global innovation manager of GenCore. So, you know, we're in the nutraceutical or supplement industry to make it more simplistic. And essentially I help create and develop products in the sports nutrition market. So you might see the likes of my protein or GNC and bulk and all these sports nutrition products. Some of the ingredients in their products are supplied by us. And I sort of work hand in hand with them to creating all these so-called innovations. So it's really fun. And how do you find time to do all these things? I won't lie, it's difficult. Um, but at a young age, I learned about time management because from the age of 12, when I traveled to Bangladesh for my first tour, I, I was already out and about and training 7 a.m. in the morning or 7 p.m. at night. So it's ultimately finding the time of the day to prioritize not only cricket, but your studies as well. And I'm, I'm lucky that I have the genetic of being a morning person. So getting up early was fine. And the best thing about cricket is that it's a team sport. So the social aspect is there with the extracurricular activity that it never dawned on me that, gosh, I'm sacrificing my social life. And I didn't even have to because there is still school to go to and socialize as well. So it never really came across. It, I, I was never stressed with balancing it all because it all just fell into place. And you mentioned about sports nutrition and stuff. How important do you think it is to get more female led sports science around nutrition especially because obviously kind of period chat and stuff is becoming more popular to talk about and there's now studies on that but nutrition I've read some papers where it's still quite male dominated where athletes are being told to eat certain amounts but that's for men and not for women so what's your thoughts there? So true um, and there's more emerging literature coming out on the female physiology and of course females are completely different to men you know we've got a hormonal cycle or menstrual cycle that goes round monthly just because you know we've got different hormone levels doesn't mean that we eat the same things either if our hormones are different day in day out why does it mean that we eat the same things and when it comes to performance within sports performance what we eat influences not only our body composition but of course our strength and power and all of that so there needs to be female specific literature that comes out and research and that's definitely emerging but definitely nutrition plays a fundamental role when it comes to that elite aspect of performance. Yeah, is there much on cricket at the moment that you're aware of in terms of any studies or? Not really. Um, the majority of studies come to injury prevention in pace bowlers, of course, because when we bowl, we put almost 10 times our body weight into that front leg. So that's definitely one of the, the most important ones. Areas that I'm really interested in is sort of the mental side of things. Cricket is probably one of the most prevalent sports when it comes to yeah, poorer psychology, I guess. I don't know how to word it, but depression, anxiety, that does come about really often. More for batsmen too. And I guess also cricket means a lot of travel overseas and being away from people. And then it's one of those things that you are a very long time retired when you do stop playing. Not everyone's going to go into punditry or commentary or that kind of thing. So I guess it is something that's so important to focus on now because it is such a mental game. You're out in the middle, pretty much on your own for hours and hours and hours, or you're in the field. You know, the other team has scored 250 for one and you're there like, oh, great, cool. We've still got another 10 overs. And you might be out for a golden duck. <laughs> And you might then be out for a golden duck, having been in the field. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But we've all been out for golden ducks. I'm going to hold my hands up and say, I have been out for a golden duck. So, you know, it's the only gold I ever seem to win. But that's fine. But, you know, we can laugh about it now. And that's, yeah, it is so important, that mental side of it. And on the topic of travel and the mental side, you did spend some time traveling. You went over to Australia, didn't you, to play over there. Yeah. What was it like to do that and just at that time see how well established everything was over there compared to quite a lot of the world because they they got it sorted very early in Australia. Yeah, I was just going to say, you nailed it there. It's, it's bizarre to see because when I went there in 2013, it was prime time for me. It was the right opportunity because it was right after high school and just before university. So I had this freedom of packing my bags and really going without any risk involved. But when I went there, the level of cricket is pretty much where the level of cricket in England is. And that's crazy to say, because England's, of course, an amazing nation to play cricket and they're very professional. But the disparity already from 
Australia to the second best, which is England, is huge. And that's just simply seeing from, I think, the, the tiers and the divisions that they play. It's a lot more structured. And being in the UK now and seeing how the domestic structure is, Premier One is completely different to Premier One in Melbourne. You know, Premier Ones, I played with Meg Lanning, Elise Perry sometimes came down to Victoria for state cricket, of course. Jess Cameron and all these, again, legends of the game were playing in the same division because the primary uh, focus was to represent your club team. And if there's any state games, then they go off. But that's only for a particular season, right? So you really did play alongside the greats. Whereas in England, I feel if you play for county, you just disappear for the whole season. And the, the level of Prem 1s was sort of, yeah, it's, it's not as good as Prem 1s in Australia. So they've got this structure set up in Australia. They've got the professionalism. And then they, we've seen the greats of the game come through in Australia. What was it like to know that you've played alongside people like Meg Lanning and been able to pick her brains? And has that had a massive impact on your game now? Yeah, uh, definitely. It was more, even without having to talk to them, because it's not like I'd be talking to them every time, but it's just watching and observing. I do, I'm a huge advocate of observational learning, whether it's watching on TV or watching them train, even doing the back end things, you know, how they pad up or what their habits and routines are when it comes to their nutrition or their setup. And even, yeah, putting their pads on, they might have their own superstitions. So that's where I started learning my own game. It's like, oh, how do they do it? How do I want want to implement certain nuggets of their game into my own one and that's what I carried forward and brought back to Hong Kong as well. Perfect and you mentioned there as well about the structures in comparison to Australia to England and especially like the club emphasis and here it does feel like kind of club is viewed so secondary mm. and then like you say people do disappear for county and now regional so what do you want to see happen in England and you are eligible to play within the regions right? Is that yeah. going to be something that you're going to do? This yeah, stuff? absolutely. I think so. And to be honest, I'm not experienced in the whole England setup that I genuinely do not understand the structure. So that's something I'm learning because I just arrived in England. But I'm currently just training for a few clubs in London to really try and understand where I'd like to play. Location being absolute key. Because I'm not going to lie, a lot of clubs are outside London and I don't drive. So a lot of trainings might be an hour and a half away, which becomes three hours, of course, of just travel time. But yeah, I would like to understand more about how the structures are the disparity of what division one and division two are how you can start playing for county what are the county teams in london and then how you can be fed through into the hundreds and the um rachel hayhoe flint yeah the, the that setup as well so you know is it something where you just need to perform in division one and you get scouted or is there tryouts these are all things that is not really known for the females i think in london I think that's kind of been the biggest thing generally is like how you get spotted from kind of club cricket because it, people have kind of just viewed it as recreational and not very good. And even like the Prem divisions and stuff, some places they treat it like it's, you know, it is Prem, it's amazing. And in other places it's just, oh, you're on the second square, you know, you're not even on the first pitch and stuff like that. So going from there to then try and get spotted into county, sometimes it's like if you aren't in the county system when you're young, yeah. And you don't get picked up playing club and stuff. And yeah. I think that whole kind of talent ID piece is changing and it will change with these new regional structures. And we've seen the Southern Vipers, they've announced they've got a new competition for the counties, but quite a lot of it is about badgering and emailing to get yourself known to be able to right. get in. There. So hopefully that does change. And well noted. <laughs> Yeah, and hopefully you can, you can call for that change because it is just at the moment about putting your hand up. So if there was a region that you'd want to play for, who would it be? Or do you still, you still need to try and figure out what's available like oh, Southeast it's, Stars. It's twofold. And... Yeah, ob obviously I'd love to play for any at the moment. Any opportunity I will absolutely grab. And in fact, it's a coincidence because I recently was asked to train with the Northern Diamonds to go up north. So I'll be heading there next week just to train with them. And that's because of course, my ex-coach from Hong Kong is their coach too. So he was like, while you're in London, you might as well just come up and bowl and play with them. So, you know, hopefully not only will I learn a lot, but hopefully I can also add some value into their trainings by bowling some pace or hitting some balls, whatever it may be. Um, and then go from there. But right now, I don't have any specific counties in mind. It's essentially just if I have the opportunity and someone asks, I will absolutely grab it. It's very much a stick your hand up and shout, pick me moment. Also, yeah. if you want a net, Clapham Commons not that far from you and me. We could play. Absolutely. I actually went there yesterday morning to hit some balls, but two out of the three nets are currently under construction. So I yeah. kind of just had to wait patiently on the side when I didn't book. <laughs> And especially if it, it does occasionally happen, it, it's awful that it does still happen, but occasionally the males do look at you and are like, 
why is she here kind of say sod them just a bit like, and then i'll be like <laughs> so this is my friend she just plays for hong kong she's just gonna bowl you so if you're just gonna stay there um yeah. we'll just show you why we're here i mean the right? amazing thing about sport is that you don't need to say anything it's more just action right you just show showcase your skills and that's also what fair breaks about it's just showcasing your talent yeah it's just amazing so obviously you're very proud to be part of fair break and we are absolutely buzzing to see you involved in that one but aside from things like that what is your proudest moment in cricket so far because it's not like you're coming in anywhere near the end of that glittering career honestly i don't mean to sound cringe or anything but it's seeing the development of the whole hong kong setup if you look at the girls right now again 70 percent of the current squad are those that we played when we were in the under-19 Hong Kong team. So back then we were 16 and kids and having fun, probably being more parented by our coach than being coached, let's say. But from then we've all matured so much and that's simply from playing the game that we love and touring a lot more with each other. That's definitely one of the proudest moments and being involved in that setup too. But when it comes to numbers or winning things, then it's the... ACC championship that we won back in Q8. It was the most incredible game because we were we needed, I think, six runs off the last over or something. And it ended up coming to the last three bowls and we needed four runs, I think it was. And we were eight down. So a new player called Natural Yip came into play and she literally swung her wholehearted bat into this ball and it, she smacked it for a six. And this is a woman who's only been playing for one or two years and she hit a six off the second last ball and we won the tournament. And it was the most amazing experience because I think just a win in general, when you win a championship, right, you've all put that effort into it and just running onto the field and jumping and, and hugging her. That's one of my fondest memory. There's so many more when it comes to, of course, facing Julian Goswami or bowling against Meg Lanning like there's so many so many career opportunities and moments that are highlight I think we need to just unpick those two you just mentioned there I don't think we can <laughs> avoid that so tell us a bit more about that so with the Julian Goswami I remember I was almost soiling my pants because this this notion of Julian Goswami bowling at you at 120 clicks maybe kilometers and this was the Asia Cup in 2014 I'd say I'm just shooting numbers but I was what 16 maybe or 17 years old so I remember just standing there at the crease like oh god this is gonna come at my foot I need to jump out the way luckily it was wide outside off so I could just sort of leave the ball but I remember hearing the ball whiz past me and I was like wow this is insane you know Julian Goswami is bowling at me and I'm playing for Hong Kong and we're playing India, basically. So that, that was just incredible. And of course, bowling at Meg Lanning. I mean, unfortunately, my teammate dropped her seven times, two of them being my bowling. So I can't claim that. But that was insane. And uh, when it comes to, yeah, the, the nurturing of the team as well, right now we're on the up. We're, we're now at a stage where we understand our game. We all know our roles within the team. So it's not just playing cricket for the sake of it and just because we can hold a ball and bowl a ball and hit a ball it's not that we're all rounders we've all got our specific roles within it and it's really just understanding that you know that we've got 14 players in the squad that can all play and it's competitive yet friendly at the same time and it's really nice to see and that enjoyment factor is such a big part of sport yes we're here to win yes we're here to you know show what we can do but if you're not enjoying it there's not really much point yeah. Yeah, if you no, I agree. Me. And I think enjoyment of the game once I was questioning whether I, I love the sport anymore or whether I was enjoying it. Because of course, if you're in a bad rut, you're in a bad rut and it's really hard to get yourself out of. But you have to really look back and ask the questions of why are you playing in the first place? And that, that ultimately funnels down to because I love the sports. You know, I played it with my brother when I was young without even playing for Hong Kong. And I loved holding a bat and playing. So it's just reminding yourself on that because I, I think the more serious you become and the more elite level that you play, the more seriously you might take the game and that can almost have a turn of events and your performance might deteriorate. So it's really just always reflecting upon your enjoyment of the game. And I think that's also really important for the young people that are watching especially young girls if they see how much you're having fun, how much you're enjoying it but also performing at such a top level, they're going to be like, you know what? I want to do that. Not only is that girl absolutely smashing it with her career and everything she's doing on the research side of life, she's also smashing it literally out in the middle. So <laughs> that's really important, I think. And talking of young people watching, you were mentioning the 100 earlier. We obviously saw that was 
huge for the women's game last year. How much would you love to get involved in something like that? Because I would be so keen to have an associate player at least on every Absolutely. side. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of my dreams, of course. It's probably the next best to playing international for England. So I would love to be involved in that setup. You know, the the amount of media that's involved in pushing and advocating women's cricket is it's insane. Even within the work setup, I once had a, a conversation with my customer and he was like, oh, I'm going to the 100 next week. And this is for the women's game. And it really blew my mind to see how much individuals and audiences in England know this format of the game. Um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the whole rules of the 100 ball but that's something that I will definitely grasp once I get involved but absolutely I'd love to do it and obviously you mentioned there are 100 and stuff but what else are your goals especially for 2022 oh putting me on the spot there unfortunately I don't qualify to rep which is crazy I don't qualify to represent Hong Kong in the Asian games because I'm not Cantonese or I'm not a Hong Konger Although I've lived in Hong Kong for 26 years of my life and was born and bred there, I'm not allowed to represent my country in the Asian Games. And the Asian Games is second best to Olympics. It's basically the Olympics of Asia. And what's bizarre is that I went to it in 2008 and 20, uh, no, 2014 it was, yet they changed the rules and I can't do it anymore. So tournaments for me is out the, the, the picture, even for Yaz, for Ruchi. So half the girls can't actually play for Hong Kong in this tournament, which is a medal tournament basically so that's that's quite upsetting but when it comes to goals I've got my own individual goals when it comes to skill set I suppose which is just really mastering the art of bowling pace and and my batting I'm working with a coach now in the UK and he's really managed to understand my game a lot more and what I need to improve on and there's a lot cricket is something that you just constantly need to tweak and improve so I'm just trying to master the art of batting too well, with all the cricket you've got coming up, it sounds like you've got quite a good, you've quite a lot on the roster that's going to help out with all of that. The, the amount of cricket you're going to be exposed to from different people all over the place, different styles of bowling, different styles of batting. It's going to be, I think you've got quite a good year ahead to pick up different things. And they're going to look at the Asian games. They're going to be like, oh, we shouldn't have changed those rules. We wanted so. someone like that playing. Yeah. So that's quite annoying. I'm aware of timing and obviously we don't want to keep you forever, but... We do like to finish off our podcast with quick fire sort of round, you know, it's not you divulging all your secrets, just a few little <laughs> quick ones. So Pressure. I'm going to kick it off. This is one of our favourite ones. And you obviously mentioned cricket teas already, but what is your favourite item at a traditional cricket tea? Ooh, a Tim Tam in Australia. Can't beat that. Your favourite ground to play at? Honestly, the home of cricket, which is for me, the Hong Kong Cricket Club. It's not Lords. <laughs> Your favourite sledge? Oh, they're batting like donuts, all edges and no centre. That's awful, but that's one that comes to mind. <laughs> I've not heard that. I quite like that. I haven't either. I'm, I'm gone. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a Hong Kong thing. <laughs> yeah, I like that though. But Favourite person you've ever played against? Oh, Meg Lanning. Yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, That's, yeah. Well, you can have that one. The last TV series you binged? Drive to Survive. Oh, such a good call. I'll tell you what, it's oh. really good. Like, I never I... used to understand Formula One. Like, my dad used to watch it on TV all the time. And I said, what, why do people watch cars going around the circuit? But it zooms in onto the, the perspectives of the, the drivers. And you're like, wow, it's actually quite a cool, yeah, cool sport. Um, last book you read? Mindset by Carol Carol Dwight. But right now I'm actually reading one called The Barefoot Coach. Um, and it's really, really good by Paddy Upton. It's about cricket and his coaching philosophies. Nice. Favourite cocktail on a night out? Gin and tonic. Oh. Have to. Okay. If you didn't play cricket, what sport would you want to play? Golf. I actually played, I wouldn't say professional, but I played in junior championships prior to cricket. But I realised that I hate playing a solo sport because it's all in your head. Um, so I transferred into a team sport. You're basically like Ash um, Barty. You know, she oh, played that, tennis, didn't yeah. want to be on her own. She went and played in the Big Bash and then went back to playing tennis. If I, if I can play in the Wimbledon and win uh, a Grand Slam, that'd be awesome. We'll see what we can do. Pick me up. Hannah, got another? I, I think that's quite, <coughs> that's probably quite good, I think. Do you think? Sweet enough. Anything else? Cats or dogs? And if you don't say dogs, I think Hannah's dog might. Dogs all the way. Always, always. Well, 
thank you so much for coming on today and talking to us about your career, everything about Hong Kong cricket and its massive monumental rise, despite you not being able to play in the Asian Games. Everything to do with Fair Break, which is just going to be absolutely phenomenal. And we cannot wait to see what comes out of that and the names that emerge because it's going to be it's going to be groundbreaking it is already and that's just gonna be fantastic we have loved having you to chat and like i said hit me up for nets on clap and common anytime and we'll go for tim tams afterwards yes um, but ready. thank you so much for joining us just quickly where can our listeners find you on social media uh so you can follow me on instagram which i believe it's mariko.hill or on twitter which is just mariko hill but i'd, I'd say instagram is the primary mode of social media that i go on Fabulous. Well, we will leave you to the rest of your afternoon. We've all got to get some sleep because there's more World Cup to watch throughout the night tonight. I know. Back to being nocturnal. Thank you so much for joining us. And it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you both for having me and listeners for listening if you're up till this end. Massive thanks to Mariko for coming on and being a guest on the podcast. It was really interesting to hear how it all worked in Hong Kong and about her playing experience and about what it's really like to take captaincy so young and having to give up that captaincy is obviously not easy so it's really interesting to hear how she dealt with all of that and how fair break is helping put players like mariko on the map and to all our listeners if you want to keep up to date with everything that we're doing you can follow us on twitter at w cricket chat on instagram at women's cricket chat and if you want to give us a like on facebook we are women's cricket chat if you'd like to give our personal twitters a follow then it's at hannity1194 at georgia heath 27 at katty coombs 98 at mihika barshney and i'm at alex jane this has been women's cricket chat tune in next time